Okay. Next is uh, Winter Haven Hospital versus Lyles. The council, before you all begin, let me uh, make a disclosure. Uh, I don't believe this is grounds for recusal, but I should disclose my sister is an employee of Winter Haven Hospital. She does not work in anywhere involving any of this. To my knowledge, she knows nothing about this case because I've never heard anything about it. I live in Winter Haven. I knew nothing about the case until I got the briefs. So I don't believe there's a reason for me to recuse, but I thought probably in the fairness I ought to disclose that uh, relationship to you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right, may it please the court. Dan Martinez for Winter Haven Hospital. This is a case that was tried, of course, in Hillsborough County involving an autopsy, uh, excuse me, in Polk involving an autopsy that occurred at Winter Haven Hospital. And there are two primary questions facing the trial judge, and that is whether or not an autopsy falls under the rubric of medical services that would in turn cause it to be analyzed under the medical malpractice statute, se chapter 766, requiring a pre-suit. No pre-suit was done in this case. Winter Haven moved to dismiss on those grounds, and that was denied. That's one of the reasons for this appeal. The argument by the plaintiffs, Ms. Lyles, is that an autopsy is not medical services, and that's because, of course, the patient is dead. However, that argument, we believe, is not persuasive and should not be accepted by this court because while the patient is dead, there are still medical services that are being provided to the corpse, and those medical services were requested by the next of kin. And so while the benefit of those medical services inures to the next of kin, there nevertheless are medical services that are being performed. In addition, we know, of course, that medical services and the pre-suit statute also includes diagnosis. Part of the reason for an autopsy, of course, is to diagnose what happened and what was the cause of death. In this case, the trial judge was persuaded that because the pathologist chose to treat internal organs as bio, biohazardous waste, that that means that those organs were cremated and that the cremation statute applies. But as briefed, the cremation statute has no application to hospitals, has no application to doctors, it has application to crematoriums and how they are to conduct their business and the authorizations that they're to receive before a body is cremated. In this case, Dr. Gordon chose, for whatever reasons he had, to treat the organs as biohazardous waste. The Florida statutes are very specific on what happens to biohazardous waste, and that is they are to be incinerated or treated by steam, but the steam deals with sharps things that you can disinfect. The only way to do it is by incineration. And so by placing them in red biohazardous bags, Dr. Gordon was following the law. In terms of whether or not this can be mixed with other biohazardous waste, the statute says that all biohazardous waste is treated the same and is incinerated in the same manner. There is no statute that indicates or that draws a distinction between what should and should not be mixed in terms of biohazardous waste. In fact, it is mixed as a regular practice in hospitals across the country, and that was part of the record in this case. Well, if, okay, help me here. The doctor, you said the doctor chose to treat this as biohazardous material. Correct. Does that suggest then the doctor did not necessarily have to choose to treat it as biohazardous material? I think that is a reasonable conclusion <coughs> on my Especially reading of the statutes. And some, some, under some circumstances, the organs are placed back with the body. Under some circumstances, they are. And if they were all biohazardous, they would all have to be <coughs> incinerated rather than there being a choice. Correct, which brings me to one of my points, which is that these statutes don't micromanage what the doctor decides is biohazardous and what the doctor decides is appropriate to put back. Well, oh, I guess my concern is the fact that the, doc the doctor chose to consider these biohazardous to invoke a statute is kind of, I mean, the fact he chose or chose not to, uh, it, it sounds like he chooses to do this so he can hide behind the statute to avoid liability or responsibility on the other side. That wasn't the intention of the argument. The intention of the argument is that at some point discretion comes into play by the doctor and there has to be room for that discretion. But, but, but the, isn't the discretion, comes in discretion whether he's gonna put it back in the body or incinerate it, not whether it's gonna be incinerated because they are biohazardous. The fact is he's just gonna incinerate them because that's the 
protocol for disposing of these organs under normal circumstances. Of biohazardous waste, right. As soon as it is pulled from the body, my reading of the statute and the administrative code is, it is technically biohazardous waste. And then what you do with that biohazardous waste is controlled by the administrative Because code. of the potentiality of being disease and that type of thing that could be passed on if it's put back in somebody else's handling. Precisely. And only... Then, if, then why, is it we, why don't we have a bright line rule that says all organs have to be biohazardous waste if that's what we're trying to protect? Well, I think that is the rule that we have. I mean, the, the well, then why do we violate the rule by putting diseased organs back in bodies and allowing undertakers to have to, to deal with it? Because the statute has an exception, and it indicates that biohazardous waste, that definition does not apply to disposal of bodies when it's done by the funeral home. And so a reasonable reading of that is if certain portions are put back in and it's then transported as biohazardous waste to the funeral home, the funeral home then has authority to dispose of it as it sees fit. The difference is when you've got an examiner at an autopsy and he's doing an autopsy on a patient who has a kidney infection as well as pneumonia, that medical examiner should have the discretion to decide what is okay to put back in the body and then send to the funeral home and what should not be. And without that discretion, we but, find our... But this discretion wasn't exercised case by case. This was a standard protocol that he did all the time. That is the testimony based on how he was trained. And so let me understand this, though. In terms of the decision that was made, this decision was made by this doctor, correct? According to the exercise of his professional judgment, you know, under the, in view of this statute that deals with this, does the hospital not have any policy, written policy about it, disposition of biohazardous waste and what it is and that sort of a thing? It does. And, and the hospital's policy was parallel to what the doctor's conduct <coughs> was in this case. The doctor's training was this is how you do it. The hospital's policy paralleled what his understanding was. Okay. In the testimony at the trial, this even reads like a medical malpractice case, which gets us back to our first argument. We've got doctors coming and testifying as to the standard of care. What is the standard of care, what's not? It's pretty clear from the record that there's a dispute as to what that standard is, and the jury makes a decision. But part of the record includes the practice guidelines to Florida medical examiners, and in those guidelines it indicates that retained organs are biomedical waste, as defined in 381-0098 and should be destroyed by the medical examiner by any legal means when the examination of the organs has been completed. But this is, this is not something he did to the organs as far as part of his treatment. This is what happens after he's finished examining them. It, it happens Why as, doesn't that fall into that Bell case where once they did the autopsy, the negligence was in what they did with the body afterwards as opposed to what happened to the body during the autopsy? because deciding what portion is biohazardous waste is part of the autopsy, whereas in Bell, my understanding is, the body was either dropped or lost while it was being transported after the autopsy. This is not a case where the organs were being transported to the funeral home and then they were lost or something along those lines. What we've got is a doctor who is faced with what to do with what he believes is biohazardous waste and in following what he believes the statute entails as to biohazardous waste, which is one option, that's to incinerate it. Well, I, I have a little difficulty raising the decision as to whether to incinerate or put back in the body to a medical decision when people do it different ways all the time and they're all okay. That's where the infectious part of it comes into play. That's where medical judgment comes into play. But he didn't, but in this case, did he, did, is, does the record show he found that because these organs were infected and potentially dangerous, they had to be treated as biohazardous waste it, rather than put back in there? It does not, not in this case. This was, this was one of just its normal routine, infected or otherwise, the normal routine was to incinerate. Exactly. Okay, that's why I'm saying I have difficulty saying this rises to a medical decision when if these had been infected organs, they were gonna be burned, if they'd been uninfected, non-infected, whatever the right word is, they would still be burned under the protocol. I have difficulty saying this rises to a medical decision that therefore becomes a medical negligence 
matter. Well, and to, to, just to follow that question, I know you haven't had a chance to answer his question, but it sounds like this wasn't a decision at all. This is the way it's done at the hospital and the way this doctor does it all the time. Right, but it okay. is done as a result of the way that these laws are structured and the result of the way that they have practiced over time, <clears throat> which was the portions that are removed and that could constitute hazardous waste, they go in the red bags, they go to the incinerator. It turns out other hospitals do it differently. And my point is simply that the statutes allow for those differences. And it comes down to the medical provider's decision on how he's going to handle it. But, well, but in order to bring it within the scope of the statute you wish, isn't it supposed to be the exercise of a medical judgment? And if what you're saying is he's not exercising a medical judgment, he's merely following an administrative protocol, then that would tend to suggest that it's not part of the medical malpractice act. In, of action. in this case, while it was while it paralleled the protocol, Dr. Gordon made his own decision to put these in the red bag. He said he did that because that's the way he was trained to do, and that training is medical training. So it necessarily is our position involves some medical judgment. Okay. okay. I didn't hear that come out in response to some of the earlier questions. So that was a more pointed question. Um, in any event, so by not viewing this as a medical service and as part and parcel of an autopsy, we believe the trial court erred in not applying the medical malpractice statutes. Secondly, by calling the incineration of biohazardous waste cremation, the trial court necessarily engrafted upon Florida law a requirement which is not there. If there is biohazardous waste, it is to be incinerated and it does not require any consent by anybody. That is simply the law. In this case, what the judge instructed the jury was that in fact, and as a practical matter, there was a law where consent was required to incinerate by calling it cremation. And because of that, the jury was confused into believing that the standard of care actually required consent for incineration. And that, we, is our position, confused the jury and resulted in an unfair trial for Winter Haven Hospital. And part so, of that is that because cremation is, is defined either by regulation or statute as a dead human body? Precisely. Precisely. And, the whole and if it's not cremation, and this really didn't involve a medical judgment to follow Judge Casanueva's question, didn't involve a medical judgment because it was simply following protocols and procedures, then perhaps it's under neither one of these statutes. Given the premises as you've laid them out, I would have to agree. So then there would be no law that controls this, I mean, no statutory law anyway. No statutory law. Yeah. In, in which case you would just get down to regular common law concepts of negligence. In terms of how to instruct the jury on the uh, cremation or the incineration. But it's still our position that it falls under 766, of course. If following that, could I take it to the next point? If there is no law in this and it would allow can anything then be outrageous or be of a conduct to equally punitive damage award? No. No. It still has to be considered outrageous by an objective standard, not a subjective standard. Um, the idea that the hospital was following the administrative code in terms of incinerating what it considered to be biohazardous waste, or at least having that as its policy, the idea that Dr. Gordon was taught to do it that way in medical school, which involves medical judgment, all should play a role in the jury's determination as to whether or not this rises to the level of willful conduct where the whole idea was let's make sure we do something that causes them severe emotional distress. It's our position that the record is lacking on that point as well, of course, as briefed. In this case, we don't have somebody who says, you know, one of the cases was the, um, I think it was the Kirksey case where you've got a cornea, an eye and a cornea being removed from a child. And, and the medical examiner relied on a statute that said, hey, I'm allowed to do that if it's requested by the eye bank. But that statute indicated that's fine, provided there's no objection from the family. And in that case, there was an objection. And then he went further. He went on to try to cover up that he'd actually taken the eyes and the cornea. In this case, we don't have that. What we have is somebody saying, I don't want my mother cremated. When a reasonable person hears that from an objective standard, cremation is the burning of a body. It is not reasonable to conclude that portions that are left over from an autopsy, which are then incinerated, somehow become cremation. That's just not how a reasonable and ordinary person of prudence would consider the term cremation. So even if we look at this record and we say, Dr. Gordon is charged with knowledge that she didn't want her mother cremated, in his mind, she wasn't cremated. 
and to instruct the jury that cremation is what applies and that you need specific uh, consent for that confused them on that issue to the point where it almost became negligence per se because there was no consent. And the law requires no consent for incineration of parts. And part of one of our examples was an appendicitis or an amputation where you don't have a dead body. If someone was to say, I don't want to be cremated, but you had an amputated finger and the finger was disposed of, I don't think it would be reasonable to conclude that there was intentional affliction of emotional distress because that body part was disposed of the way that the law requires. And that analogy carries forward logically to our situation. Do you want to reserve any time? Yes, sir. That was my next point. If, unless there are any other questions, I'll reserve for rebuttal. Okay. You have five minutes left. Thank, Thank you. you. May it please the court, my name is Joel Eaton, and I represent the plaintiff, um, Appley Brandy Lyles. I should alert you at the outset that I have reached mandatory retirement age. I don't hear as well as I used to. My hearing aids help a bit, but if you could speak up, it would be very helpful to me. Thank you. Um, my principal difficulty with Mr. Martinez's argument is that it was, a jury, it was the jury argument based on their version of the facts, which simply ignores the facts viewed in the proper light in view of the plaintiff's favorable verdict. And this is one of those unusual cases in which I think the facts answer all the legal questions. Uh, because the facts in this case are simply outrageous. Um, Ms. Sutka's daughter was told by her mother that when she passed, she did not want to be cremated under any circumstances. She did not want to be burned. She fell ill over Easter weekend. She went to the emergency room with stomach cramps uh, and died during the night. Nobody knew why. The hospital had absolutely no clue why this woman died. The daughter asked for an autopsy to try and find out what the cause of death was. The hospital gave her a form to sign which did not disclose the hospital's policy, a written policy that the internal organs would be taken to the incinerator, mixed with the hospital's garbage and trash, reduced to ashes, and dumped in a landfill. The evidence is undisputed from the doctor, all his experts, the county medical examiner that permission is required before you can incinerate or cremate a body. The hospital did not obtain that permission. The daughter told the treating, the attending physician and two of the nurses, including the nurse that gave her the consent form to sign, that her mother was not to be cremated. That was not communicated to Dr. Gordon, the pathologist. Dr. Gordon testified that had I known the daughter's wishes, I would have returned the organs to the body. I was not required to incinerate these organs. Had, he known, had he known the wishes that she not be cremated or known the wishes that she wanted the organs returned? The hospital's personnel... If he'd simply said, you don't want the body cremated, does that automatically mean the doctor would have been on notice that she intend, indeed wants the organs returned? It's the same thing? I think so. They play a little game below. Incineration is not the same thing as cremation. In fact, the two words are synonymous. They are synonyms. When you cremate somebody, you But when somebody them. says, I don't want my body cremated, does that also mean, and if you do an autopsy, you have to return my organs to my body so that they can go through the embalming process, which evidently is almost as injurious as cremation. Well, we're dealing with the Well, I, I, that's what we're dealing with, something that's outrageous, so outrageous that it shocks the conscience of the community. And what we're saying is that it's so outrageous that these organs were burned instead of returned so they could be embalmed by the process of embalming. It's a little worse than that, Your Honor. These organs were mixed with the garbage from the cafeteria and all the papers and trash from the trash cans put in an incinerator together, burned, and then dumped in a landfill, in a garbage dump. The and, daughters the body, and the body was embalmed, and they had a funeral, 
and went through the closing grieving process and 10 days later found out of the uh, the incomplete report and then and only then began to find out all this other right well she wanted a second autopsy. She went to the funeral director. And, and that's where I thought we were going is she was denied a second autopsy. They were covering something up, and that's the reason there should have been. But that's not even a part of it. The issue is that she, only because she wanted a second autopsy, that was the way, that was her means or her vehicle for finding out that these organs had been incinerated. I imagine most of the people that this has happened to never do find out because the hospital won't tell you, and they, and they, specifically testified but what I'm getting at though is if you have a body it's embalmed you have a funeral you go through all the customary social close a grieving procedures rituals and then you find out oh by the way some things that you never see at a, at a funeral happen to be destroyed other than being inside there that is so outrageous that it shocks the community you know I handled a case a long time ago in this court called Smith versus Telephase National Cremation Society in which the cremation society couldn't locate the ashes of the decedent and they gave the ashes of somebody else to the widow. She went out to scatter them on places with, where they had uh, had a good time to discover later that in fact the funeral home scattered her husband's ashes at sea which is what he didn't want done, and this court held that a jury question was committed on whether this was outrageous, extreme and outrageous conduct that would support an award of punitive damages, and it affirmed a substantial judgment. Now, I have cited a dozen other cases in the brief, and I don't have time to go over them, but the facts in this case, in my judgment, are considerably more outrageous than a lot of these cases in which the courts have said that the tort was satisfied but you would agree that it is out of the ordinary that you take ashes and take the wrong ashes and scatter them at sea uh, rather than returning them to the proper next of kin. That's out of the ordinary. You, you but know, the you, disposal of internal organs after an autopsy by incineration is commonplace all over the country. I, I'm reluctant to agree with any difficult question like that because I'm convinced that Mr. Martinez is trying to focus this court on the autopsy. Dr. Gordon's not an appellant here and we're not complaining about the autopsy. Yeah. What we're complaining about is what the hospital did with the You're remains. You're complaining about the doctor following a common practice that's used all over the country that's been used by him for 29 years that is the hospital's protocol and that that is outrageous conduct that deserves punitive damages of a million dollars. I, I find that a little difficult to justify that that is so outrageous when it's done all over. And furthermore, when you have an autopsy and they take your organs out, they, you know, it's pretty gross in and of itself, but that's what has to happen. He does some tests. He very possibly could have said, you know, I need to keep these organs and keep working on these organs after you have the funeral. Do you want me to hold your body up for two months while I do my test, or do you want to go ahead and have the funeral? Obviously, they'd have the funeral. The, That's outrageous. The two-sentence consent form that Ms. Lyle signed gave permission for the pathologist to retain organs, if necessary, for further study. And her burying the body without those organs, because they're being tested, is not a problem. But then once he finished those tests, his failure to return them so they could be buried separately is outrageous. He didn't retain any no. organs for further I understand, study. but what that consent form gave her the knowledge was those organs could be retained. And she buried her mother. They weren't retained. I understand they weren't, but that's the consent form said they could be. And what I'm suggesting is, if they had have been, are you saying that it would be outrageous unless he gave them back to her so she could have a separate burial of the internal organs? No, the standard practice according to the plaintiff's evidence in this case, and it has to, facts have to be viewed in a light most favorable to the plaintiff here, is that this is not a standard practice. That it doesn't always happen at this particular hospital even. The funeral home director that 
handle this body said he sometimes gets bodies. I thought he said that this was at Winter Haven Hospital, the only hospital in the area that doesn't normally put the organs back in, and that it was routine at Winter Haven Hospital not to get the organs back. No, he testified that he sometimes received autopsy bodies with the organs replaced in the body, which is standard apparently all over the state. From Winter Haven Hospital? Yes. I'll have to go back and look. I thought, okay. I thought the testimony was from the funeral director that Winter Haven Hospital was the exception in the area because he that didn't happen at Winter Haven Hospital where the other hospitals did. No, there is a record reference to that fact in my brief, Your Honor. Okay, I misread the record then. Let me, if I may, and I know you're trying to tell us some things, but I have a few questions I just want to ask. At the time she wanted the second autopsy, does our record show us what her expectation was? In other words, do we know that she expected that the hospital was, had retained these organs and would test them again? I don't know what she expected. She didn't testify what she expected, but she, did, she also didn't expect to discover that okay. they had retained, I mean burned her organs and put them in a, in a dump. Okay. Because this whole thing got triggered because she, for whatever reason, decided she wanted a second autopsy. And I guess my thinking was, was, her, was it her expectation that the body would be exhumed and another autopsy would be done, or that she thought that these organs were retained by the hospital and she could merely ask that they be tested again? No, I, I, we pretty, just don't know that, I guess. I'm pretty sure there's a reasonable inference that she expected that the mother's okay. whole body was there. And she went to the funeral home and said, look, the first autopsy found nothing, no cause of death. I'm still curious, can there be a second autopsy? The funeral director told her, sorry, all the organs are gone. You'll have to go back to the hospital and ask for it. Okay. Um, that's what happened. Again, the focus here has to be on the hospital's conduct, not on the doctor's conduct, because the hospital is the appellant here, not the doctor. And it is the hospital's policy which is contrary to the evidence at trial, that you don't tell the next of kin what the policy is because you're afraid it'll upset them. And our policy is we're gonna take your internal organs, put them in a bag, mix them with the garbage, burn them in our incinerator, and dump them in a dump in Orlando. But, but, but there is that, nothing legally wrong with doing that. Is that correct? Is that a fair? In other words, is that a disposition of these organs that is consistent with the law? We're not arguing that what was done was illegal. Well, I, we're I, arguing that we didn't get permission to do, the hospital didn't get permission to do what it did, and that its policy of dumping these ashes and the garbage in a landfill is the type of conduct that was reckless that caused extreme. Uh, mental distress. But doesn't that bear on the issue of punitive damages? If, if the jury verdict is, a, is upheld, as the trial judge did, on the cause of action for in reckless infliction of mental distress, punitive damages are automatically supported by the evidence. That's what the cases say. Reckless conduct causing severe mental anguish. But, yeah. but if the conduct is legal, it's consistent with the law, how can it be reckless? It's reckless because every other every other standard of recklessness. Okay, I, I'm, I've missed the key point here. The key point is that every witness in this case, including the hospital's witnesses, the doctor testified that it is improper to cremate somebody's remains in whole or in part without the permission of the next of kin, which they did not get in this case. Every witness testified it's improper to cremate the remains in part. Is that what they said? Every, no. doc, every, every witness said it was improper to cremate internal organs. You're not going to get me into the trap of thinking there's a difference well, you, between see, the you, whole see, body see, and see, the parts. See, well, see, you made a statement. <laughs> you made a statement that was blanket. Now, I think every, part, every party would testify that it's improper to cremate a body without permission. But to say in whole or in part is a broader statement that I'm not so sure the record would reflect every witness said. The whole doesn't include the half that, that was cremated here. I, I think everybody agreed that if you take a human body and you cremate it without permission, that's not against the law, that's outrageous. How about if you took but half a human body? But if you take body. an organ 
I don't know that every wit every witness said. And I'm not. I'm not. All I'm saying is that I'm just. I'm just trying to pin down. I don't think the, every witness said everybody in part. I think they said everybody, but I don't think they said in part. Well, they did play that little game below. It all only applies to the whole body and not the half of the body that was dumped. But that's the, isn't that the essence of what we're here about? Because we have biohazardous waste that was handled in a manner that's not only consistent with law, but consistent with inf good infection control and good medical practices. But the difficulty is we have a loved one who didn't know that was going to happen. And when she learned that it happened, it, it was inconsistent with her wishes at the time. So the question we have to decide is whether the fact that it was disposed of in a manner that's consistent with good practices and consistent with the law is outrageous enough in these particular factual circumstances to justify what the jury did. You can't cremate human remains without permission of the next of kin. That I think everybody undisputed. knows that. I, okay. I don't think that's a dispute here. I think everybody gets that. Dr. Gordon, the pathologist, said if she had asked me to retain the organs and put them back in the body, I would have honored that request. One of the expert pathologists that testified for one of the defendants, I forget which one, said when we incinerate organs with the permission of the next of kin, we incinerate them in a medical incinerator, only medical waste. We don't mix it with the garbage from the hospital. Dr. Gordon, the pathologist, conceded on the stand that it was improper, perhaps even illegal, I'd have to go back and check the record reference, to mix human remains with the hospital's garbage. If they had the permission to do what they did, in this case, we wouldn't be here. This is not a medical malpractice case. This case is about disposition of the human remains in a manner which, once discovered, caused severe emotional distress. It's simply not a medical malpractice case. It does not require medical skill or judgment. So what should the hospital have done in this situation? The hospital should what have What type used, of informed consent, let me rephrase that, should they have given her? Several forms were put in evidence here from the American College of Pathologists, from the hospitals at which the defendant's experts worked, which explained the procedure and gave the next of kin an option as to how the remains after the autopsy would be disposed of. Once she is fully informed, if she says, okay, mix them with the garbage, throw them in the incinerator and, dump, and put them in a dump, we wouldn't be here. They didn't tell her that. They specifically testified that we don't tell people that because it gets them upset, but that's our written policy. So mm -hmm. she's completely in the blind. And the, the, and the funeral home director doesn't just describe what all is going to be done when they get a consent to embalm either because they know that's a pretty graphic, gross description. Well, you just drain the fluids, that's all. You, well, I mean, you still have all the organs. That, you're saying that the hospital is, because they were trying to not bring those things up, that may, may, automatically makes it faulty, then it should apply that in other consents, if you don't give all those graphic details, that should also be faulty. What I would like the court to focus on in the, in the last few minutes I have here is that we're here about the hospital's conduct, not the autopsy. We're not complaining about the manner in which the autopsy was performed. I think we, I think we understand that. Okay. What the hospital did in this case was have a policy, and a policy will support an award of punitive damages against a corporate employer. Mr. Martinez hadn't argued that point, but we've covered it in the briefs. What the hospital did in this case was have a policy not to inform next of kin what the policy was because they were afraid it would upset them, not to give them a form like other hospitals do, which give them an option of the disposition of the body. We have undisputed, absolutely undisputed evidence in the case that it is the next of kin's exclusive right to determine disposition of the body and its remains. And that's the important point. 
it is the next of kin that makes the determination once fully informed how the remains are to be treated. That clearly takes it out of Chapter 766 because no medical skill or judgment is required for the next of kin to make the decision. The hospital kept the information from her, didn't get her permission, in spite of the fact that everybody agreed permission was required to do what the pathologist did. The remains were thrown in a bag, picked up, is mixed with the garbage, incinerated, and put in a dump. The hospital's in policy here did say, or did it, I don't know, did it say that you need to understand that during the autopsy, internal organs may be retained? I want to quote what this consent form says, because Mr. Martinez argues in his reply brief that the consent form said they had permission to retain organs, and that's not fair. Okay, well, I just said, because, does it say it or does it? Because what this consent form says is not simply that you can retain organs. It says you have permission is granted to retain such tissues and organs as may be deemed necessary for further study. Okay, okay, now that's just fine. And now let me ask happen. you this, let me ask you this. If, hypothetical, not this case, I understand, not these facts. If, in fact, the hospital deemed, that Dr. Gordon had deemed it necessary to retain the organs, is it your argument that he then needs to come back and get the, the direction of the next of kin as how those retained organs should be disposed of upon their completion, upon his completion of his autopsy? Because, because you've made, made the statement that the next of kin has the right to have the final say-so on the disposition of any portion of the body. So if they were to retain, should that policy also say, and if they are retained, we will come back to you and ask you whether you want to have these incinerated or whether you want us to have them returned to you so you can have them further disposed of here according to law. Because those were not the facts in this case, that issue was not decided, and I'm not sure what the answer is. Well, but, but here's is. the point. What you, the argument you're making is, is every, that the next of kin has the right to decide on the disposal of every portion of the body. And if that is true, then it seems to me we've got to say, and should the doctor retain those organs, you've got to come back and get their permission as how you dispose of those retained organs. And, and now, if, if that's what your argument is, then that's fine. But if your argument's not going that far, then I'm questioning the validity of the statement that the next of kin has the right to determine the disposal of every organ of the body. I, I don't think that's a fair hypothetical. In the typical case where an organ is retained, you have removed 12 or 15 organs in the process of this autopsy. You find one like a liver that may have something that needs some further study. You take the liver, you retain it, you do the further study on it, you put the rest of them back in the cavity of the body. Um, you don't keep but all I, 12 but or 15. But if the law organs. is, what you said, that the, the, part, the next of kin has the right to determine the disposition of every part of the body, and that was how far you took the argument. Now, I'm just asking, do you really want to take it that far? I think if you got one liver in a bottle of formaldehyde, that uh, okay. the, so you one liver relinquished your right. Put a liver to and a kidney, a liver, a kidney, and a pancreas. Where do we draw the line? We draw the line at requiring the hospital to explain the options. So the that informed are consent should say, and if any or all of the organs are retained, we will ask your direction as to disposition of those retained organs. Not, not unfair way to handle the problem, but it was not okay. the facts in this case. So okay, I understand, I but I just want to see how far yeah. this, this statement of law would take us under other facts. I would ask in closing for this court to compare the other cases cited in my brief that have upheld jury verdicts for reckless infliction of mental distress in the context of the mishandling of a dead body. And I'm convinced that this court will find that the facts in this case are far worse than the Smith versus Telephase case.
This court's recent decision in Millett, in which Judge Davis was on the panel, all he did there was pick up a body, ship it to Texas, rebury it without permission of the next of kin. After the wife came in and said to the funeral home, I know she's going to ask, but don't send it. And in the, this case, Ms. Lyles told at least three and probably more don't people that you cannot, body. and I, I don't want you to cremate my mother. And please understand that this case is not about the autopsy. It's about the fact that these remains were mixed with garbage, burned, and dumped in a landfill. And if that doesn't justify uh, recognition of a, a reckless infliction of mental distress and the special solicitude afforded to the type of context and issue here, uh, then there is no cause of action uh, under Section 46. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We, we uh, took him a little longer because we were asking a lot of questions and engaged, so I'll give you your five minutes plus a little bit extra. But let me start off by asking you, it seems to me that we've got two, two parts of um, the emotional evaluation. One is the fact that they were burned when said, I, don't, mom's, I promised mom she would be cremated. But the other is, is that it wasn't just they were burned, but all the, the emotional ramifications of, yeah, I went in with the, the other garbage and just handled this. Uh, you know, that was my mother. And now here it is basically Sunday dinner scraps as well as everything else. Why doesn't, why doesn't the jury get to focus on that aspect of it as well as the, the fact that it you know, burned versus not burned one thing, but the manner in which it was handled afterward? Why wouldn't that support a, uh, an outrageous? For a couple of reasons. One, you're talking about a subjective standard, and the law requires that it be objective, that just about any member of the community would shout outrageous. And in this case, what we have is there's no dispute that once those organs come out of the body, they meet the very definition of biohazardous waste. The question is, what do you do with them at that point? And as part of this autopsy, these things are going to get cut up. Slides are going to be taken. This is The organs aren't in their complete nature when he's done. There is always going to be something that is lost, some tissue, some blood, some fluids. They will always be disposed of. There's no way to get it all back. If the law says that biohazardous waste must be handled in this manner, and that is the manner in which the hospital handled it, we can all envision situations where people can get upset. But from a reasonable standpoint, from the standpoint of the community, but just this, but this was a this was a jury question. Doesn't the jury? I mean, are you asking us to say that those six persons were unreasonable in making that conclusion? That the facts say that these were six unreasonable people when they heard what they heard? Their decision is tainted by the fact that they were instructed that consent was required for incineration. And that is where this thing kind of went off the tracks for the most part as far as the jury question goes. There is no requirement for any consent whatsoever by the next of kin for disposition of, of uh, biomedical waste. Well, the, the incineration of biomedical waste is legal and the statute addresses that. But I saw nowhere in the statute where it said, it's, and it's okay to take this biomedical waste and lump it with the kitchen garbage and incinerate it together. It, it does, and you can read that into the statute. I, I've got it here with me, but what it says, it defines what biohazardous waste is, and then it says it includes these things, and it even includes veterinary biohazardous waste, all these things, all, and they lump them all together. And then they say, here's how you treat biohazardous okay. waste. And so I think a fair reading is that you, you can mix them. Okay. And at some, point, at some point down the stream, they're going to be mixed. There's no avoiding that. One of the things that um, I wanted to respond to is that there, I didn't hear any argument as to why the cremation statute was necessary for the jury to determine whether or not consent was adequate under 872, the autopsy statute. If we're really just talking about this is a consent issue and it's under 872 and maybe the standard of care was or was not met, there's no reason to bring the cremation statute into play because it, it has no application. But by bringing it into play, the jury automatically thought consent was required, and that may very well be what triggered the outrageousness in their minds. And under those circumstances, the hospital could not have had a fair trial, is our position. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you both. Very, very interesting argue. case.
uh, four verses.